Hello and welcome to Behind the Code, where we look at some amazing stuff in Replit and how it's been built. I'm here today with Mohamed Sarini, who's one of our software engineers. Hi, Mohamed. Hi, David. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. Thank you very much. And thank you for bringing your cat, which we can see in the background. Yes, Dex. <laughs> now, we are going to talk today about Ghostwriter Chat, which honestly is one of the biggest and most exciting changes we've had to Replit in a long time. And I'll just say up front, I am completely addicted to it. And if it wasn't for Ghostwriter Chat, I think I would be, you know, 50% less productive. So up front, a big, big thanks to you. Oh, no, I'm, I'm glad people get to use it and enjoy it. So that's all we want at the end of the day. I think that's the, that's probably the dream of all software developers, isn't it? Somebody actually uses my stuff. <laughs> oh, exactly. <laughs> so we're going to start today by just asking you to introduce us to Ghostwriter Chat. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so this is this is Ghostwriter Chat. Uh, it's integrated into you know our Replit uh, workspace, and and the idea is you know people program people need you know break their flow and they have questions. So what if you had like your own personal programmer? with you at all times. Um, so let's say, you know, I want to, I want to start a Python app. I don't really know, you know, I could ask, but I know I want it to be a web app. So I'd be like, write me a web server. So here we go. Now let's see how this goes. <laughs> so let's see what happens. And you can see it's running. And you know, Ghostwriter is awesome. So it has all of your file context, right? So let's say, you, hmm, I want it to not print hello world. Let's say, let's say I want to change, you know, my web server to, I see it's writing hello world, but I don't, I don't really want that. I want to say change my web server to return hello David. Let's see. Hello, David. You know, <laughs> here we go. Amazing, right? Um, yeah. And the, and the big power of it is also just the, the, the how easy it is to copy and paste the code in as well. It's just sort of a two click job. It's brilliant. Yeah, that, that's that's the hope, right? Like, you shouldn't need to know everything about every programming language to try something. We wanted to allow people to quickly scaffold their projects, um, prototype something, and most importantly, like learn and become better at programming themselves. And, you know, I just learned something new. Hopefully you did too. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Um, so one of the things that is dear to me is Ghostwriter Debugger. Can we have a quick demo of that as well? Oh yeah, of course. Um, similar, you know, to we want everybody to have a pair programmer um, and, you know, not everybody should have to know everything or have to, you know, go Google searching every small convenience. What if there is a nice way for me to figure out what an error is? So let's figure out this, right? So let's say I have a typo. Um, I don't really know. I didn't notice, right? I wasn't being super careful. I start and let me start my shell here. And what if I do curl? You see, I just got an error. And, you know, it's it's a bunch of red text. I don't really know what it means. So let's click Ghostwriter Debugger. Okay, so on line eight, I have a typo. It says there is a typo. It should be write file, not write file, write, not with two E's. So let's try this again. Oops. Let's try this again. Awesome. No more errors. Um, right. So, so yeah, we take your file context, like your normal chat, we take your chat history and we take your code and the error message and we kind of try our best to help you debug without ever having to leave your editor. I, I, I've got to say, this has changed my life so much to the point where, honestly, I don't think I could code without it anymore because the moment I get an error, I don't even bother to read it. I just click the button and let it tell me where the problem is and, and how to fix it. And you know, the vast majority of the time it gets me there, which is great. I also really, really love the, the preempting um, debugging we're doing when, when the um, 
when there's an error highlighted in the code editor and we can just hover over it and click the button, that's brilliant as well. In fact, there's so much to this that honestly, if you've not tried it out, uh, to everyone watching this, go and try it out immediately. It will change your life. But you know, Mohammed's not here for me to just gush at him about how fantastic <laughs> I think this is. Uh, so let's get on to the questions because we want to find out how it was built. So like, everyone says we're fast at shipping at Replit, but this in particular went from prototype to uh, in production over the course of what, a month? Didn't you prototype it at Hack Week? Uh, yeah, so my team uh, at Hack Week, we wanted to, we had like some rough ideas and like really, really rough prototype and just like a general thought, like how can we bring LLMs to our our users? Um, so yeah, the whole week we stayed up prototyping debugger, prototyping Ghostwriter chat. And then we got we got our very first version. Um, it's it's different than what you see today. Today is much better than what it was. Um, and that's <laughs> kind of what we worked on over that month. But we, we basically got it to a spot in that first week where you know you had your chat chat history back and forth your your basic file context and then a very rough debugger um and then you know over the next month we added all different kinds of file context different kinds of prompt strategies you know more accurate error debugging uh how do we figuring out what's the best way in your console when you see an error how do you know it's an error um and really nailing down all those little details um and giving you a good experience that you see today the polish on it is amazing, I have to say. And um, having been in the room to witness the demo of it, it's come such a long way in a month. It's fantastic. It's a great, um, a great undertaking. So well done. Thank you. <laughs> it was the help of a lot of people. So it was, it was great. Out of interest, how many people are on the team that worked on this? The initial prototyping team during Hack Week is probably like four or five we, we worked on like various branches of the product we worked on like mm -hmm. chat we worked on debugger we worked on some like other features that i think have been like demoed on like twitter and other places and then going forward i think it's been two to two or three others that have worked on the different different life cycles um, of the project that's fantastic i met a lot of people that, that watch this are uh, interested in becoming devs or are independent devs so it's nice to get an idea about what that looks like in a team so thank you for that um, so starting simply then, right, talk us through what is a large language model? Yeah, um, a large language model is a type of deep learning model. Um, typically, you know, you see machine learning and they do things like classification. So like, give me, you know, a bunch of features and then output a variable. Like, is something spam or is it abuse? Um, large language models are a little bit different. They're trained on like raw text. Um, or code, there's like code generation models as well. Um, so they, you, you give it a amount of text that has to fit in some context window. You, you break this text down into like embeddings or tokens, something that the model can understand. It doesn't understand raw text like me or you. So it takes chunks of characters, breaks them down into these numerical representations, passes it into a specific kind of like deep, deep neural network architecture. It's a little bit different. Um, and then it also on the other end starts generating tokens. Um, so you give it text, it does a bunch of stuff, and then it predicts the remaining tokens <laughs> um, that are generated in the next step of the sequence. So if you, it's basically completing the code you gave it in for text. Mm -hmm. So I, I've I've heard it mentioned online that it's sort of like um, it's almost like it's just working out which letter to put next, and that's how it comes together. But it it feels almost magical, honestly. The 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 way it can complete and work out meaning, which is pretty cool. Yeah, and inside of it, it has a bunch of like attention mechanisms where it can it kind of learns the structure and it exactly what you're saying. It mm -hmm. takes what it's seen, looks at it, and then predicts what is like most likely the next character or token output. Uh, it's just fascinating that you know we can get to such a good place with that. But going on from that, then um, one of the things I've asked about internally is just why Ghostwriter Chat seems so fast. I mean, if you compare it to something like um, GPT three point five or four, it seems to just smash through the tokens and output straight away. What's what's the secret to the latency? Uh, the, one of the big things is streaming. Um, we try and keep our overhead, you know pre pre request post request to a minimum um, language models are notoriously slow 
Uh, so like whenever you ask it a question and it's generating your entire block of code, you, you don't want to wait until, you know, all couple hundred tokens have generated. That's not a good experience for you or anybody else. Um, so what we try and do is stream stuff as quickly as possible. Uh, we try and keep pre-processing to like a, a bare minimum where we construct your prompts pretty fast. We're grabbing your file history. We try and keep everything, you know, cached and up to date. Um, so, so that's, that's kind of our, our approach is keep all the stuff that's important cached, make your requests and then stream back and, you know, do all the post-processing later. It is just so shocking. And again, guys, if you've not tried it out, go try it out. How quick results come back, usable results, how quick the code is is spat out. And I'm sure there's lots of people watching this that are used to, you know, going on chat GPT and asking it for code for something. And you wait the 20 minutes for it to slowly line by line output <laughs> it. Ghostwriter chat's not like that. Ghostwriter chat is almost just throwing the code at you. It's really, really exciting. Um, I was talking to our developer advocate Zahid the other day about prompt engineering. And one of the things he said was that the, the prompt itself can sometimes have an impact on, on the model. Is that something that you um, encountered as you were working? Does that increase the latency or decrease the, the processing speed? Um, the, the prompt contents itself, not so much, more so how much, how much prompt you give it. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of like I mentioned before, the longer the prompt, it has to create more tokens more has to pass through through the network and then you know how much you generate as well so the more you generate the longer it's going to take the special source is keeping that payload as small as possible then presumably we we actually try and keep it as large as possible we want to oh. give the model as much information as possible so it's only useful it's as useful as the information it has um mm -hmm. without you know contents of your files or your chat history it, it can hallucinate. Um, so we try and stuff as much important information as possible. We only, we try our very best to construct prompts in a way where it kind of learns a specific kind of output. So for debugger, we try and coerce it to be your errors on line X and, you know, replace this with this. So that that's a huge prompt we wrote. Um, and for your file context, when you're asking it questions, we, we try and do our best to figure out which files will help the model answer this for you. So if I'm in main.py, like we just saw, and I asked it a question, I was just editing it, maybe, you know, that's the best place to look. And main.py in the last X files I was editing. Um, so that, that's kind of the approach. We, we want to stuff as much information uh, as we can. Is that how you get the level of accuracy? So you mentioned hallucinating. And, you know, um, on our Replit 101 live stream the other day, uh, I was um, looking at a, a question on the Ask Forum where somebody pasted some code and they got from ChatGPT, and it was just nonsense. It looked good, but it wasn't a real library to import. You know, there weren't real functions. Uh, we don't seem to have hallucinations, or at least I've not encountered them. So what do you do to the prompts to give them that level of accuracy? Yeah, I, I think that's mostly the the file context we give it. So it, it, it's supposed to learn, you know, my main.py. In the example, I didn't have, you know, a, uh, a library imported for being a web server. So it, it picked a, like a popular one that was pretty, pretty standard. Um, so mm -hmm. the risk of hallucination was pretty low. But it, as your program gets more complex, we, we hope it learns from the import statements. So it should, you know, have some kind of context of this HTTP server library now, the next time I ask it a question, it, it shouldn't like ask for Flask or Fast API or, or a, a different framework and give me like garbage, like you mentioned. It mm -hmm. should it should learn and say, okay, well, my input has these libraries. I should probably use them. Uh, and it's so it's really it's very very good at trying to do similar patterns uh, for what you already have. Um, but if you were to ask it to do something, you know, out of this world, uh, it, it still might hallucinate. Um, but it, we, but I guess that's also kind of a, a problem with the question being asked. I, we, we find that if people are asking reasonable questions, like, how do I extend this? How do I implement that? Um, it does very well. But if you ask, how do I, you know, land a man on the moon. Like it's gonna, it's gonna import some random Python library and call a random function. I found it really, um, really useful for me when I was doing um, 
a, a learn course on uh, making a Discord bot, but not just any old Discord bot. You know, I wanted interactivity in it and gamification, all that sort of stuff. Um, and I'd not worked with most of the APIs before, so it was great because instead of having to Google and then cr you know claw through the results and find the bit you want and customize it, I asked Ghostwriter Chat, and because it had the context of what I was working on, it just went boom. Here's the answer, and honestly. Like we 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 say we talk about like the thousand X developer a lot, but you know, for somebody that is, you know, my I my day to day is not being a developer. I show people how to code, um, and it made me so much more productive and so much better at what I was doing. Um, so again, thank you. It's really cool. <laughs> now that's now, that that's our hope. The, the 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 feature I want to dig into a little bit deeper, of course, is Ghostwriter Debugger because. Yep. That is the thing that like has, has been really sticky with me is the debugger. Um, so can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, so for, for debugger, it's a complete, completely different kind of prompt. Um, different entry points into our Ghostwriter app, we, we need different prompts, right? Like if I want to mm -hmm. debug code and I give it the same you know structure as a normal chat, it's going to be really talkative and you know probably not straight to the point. Like... <laughs> Ghostwriter chat loves to talk as uh, a lot of the other, you know, chatbots do. Um, so we, we constructed a prompt, right? We, we, we give it a, a chain of thought, right? So what that means is we, we give it our base prompt and, you know, mm -hmm. we tell it all the stuff about its ghostwriter, what it has access to, how it works. Then we give it a couple examples. Um, we, we kind of show it, this is a stack trace. This is how we want you to answer. This is a, a different kind of error. This is how we want you to answer. So we, we, teach it through the prompt how to respond to errors. And then that's kind of how we get it to say on line X, this is the error and you could replace it with this and this. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the underlying technologies are all the same, um, but it's mostly the prompt construction and kind of how we try and chorus it to give us line numbers and a replacement and a bug fix as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's the important bit, isn't it? I, I, I've had such a great time with it. Um, but you know, speaking of, of how you construct the prompts and sort of tokens and things like that, where I've struggled with LMs a lot is just that token limit. Because until, you know, until GPT-4, we've had reasonably small token limits that we've needed to deal with. Um, presumably, adding in source code to a prompt increases that size a lot um, and means you'll hit those limits quickly. So how do you work around the limitation of tokens? Yeah, we, we had to come up with some heuristics. Um, some, some of them are, we have to introduce an arbitrary, you know, message size and mm -hmm. response size. That's because, and, and like chat history window. So if you let, you know, 500 tokens input, 500 token output, that's a thousand. And then let's say a model has a 2000 token limit. That's only, that's only two messages, right? And that's two, mm -hmm. two messages in your history. And then you can't ask it any more questions and you can't include file history. So we kind of like chunked up the amount of tokens based on the model. And we, we thought we want, you know, file context to be this much. We want this much of the prompt to be your chat history. And we want. And from that, right, we said, okay, so if we have this many tokens for your chat history, what's a reasonable amount we can have for um, your your question and your response? Usually, it, we found people want larger responses than questions. You want to ask it something that you're not really sure how to do, and then you want it to kind of teach you and then give you an example. So that's that's our kind of logic. And the same thing for file context. In the perfect world, like you mentioned, we'd have an infinite context window, and we would give you know, at all of the files and all of your REPLs and it would know everything. But, you know, that's not feasible right now, maybe one day. Um, so some of the heuristics is kind of what I alluded to before. We, we think people are going to be asking questions about the task at hand. So like I'm writing some code and then I'm kind of stuck. Let me hop mm -hmm. in the ghostwriter. Um, and then, and then it, so it has the context of my files that I recently touched. Um, so that's how we kind of limit that and kind of try and fit as much useful information. And the same thing with debugger, right? You can make the assumption it's not, you know, it doesn't work all the time, but if you're 
programming running, programming running, programming running. At some point, you you edited something that broke, and we can kind of scan through your recent, <laughs> you scan through your recent files and kind of do our best guess and be like, hey, based on this stack trace, this is probably what happened. Let's give you know the model this. That's that's fascinating. Thank you so much for that. Um, I need to take that on board. I, I've just realized that some of my um, some of my example projects that I've given out with my videos, I didn't. Uh, I just infinitely looped the um, the message history. So at some point, that's <laughs> going to break the token limit. <laughs> so thank you for pointing the flaws in my own code as well. I go and fix that myself. Okay, so now we're on to sort of the fun questions. The first thing is we released it uh, what a month or two ago. What was the reception like? And uh, was there anything surprising in how users got their hands on it and what they did with it? Yeah, people people just off the beginning, like from the beginning, just started building things they never did. Some of my favorite examples were, hey, you know, I didn't know X programming language and I wanted to learn it, so I built Y project. And I think I thought that was really cool. Um, I've I've used it myself, you know, I want to learn a programming language, or I don't know how to do something in a programming language, or I want to explain some code in a different programming language that I'm not so familiar with. Um, th those are some of my favorites. And then, then people kind of went above and beyond. And then as they started getting more popular, people started building their own, you know, and then supercharging it with like embeddings and, you know, searching and all of that stuff, which is super cool. Um, so, I, I guess just the fact that people are, are learning and actually finding some use and it's, it's hopefully doing its goal of like making people not scared to program and excited to program. And, you know, nobody should be stuck and frustrated on how to do something. It should be, it should be, you know, fun and learning and you should focus on um, like the task at hand and not all these hopefully minor inconveniences that will be less apparent now that are kind of like you're stuck on for hours and you know, you're like, I don't want to do this anymore. You drop your project. We don't want that. Hopefully this is allowing people to push through some of those. Absolutely. I think, I think that's, that's such an insightful point because those of us that have been programming for a long time, we're used to my code doesn't work and it's been six hours and I just yep. need to go for a walk and clear my head and come back and try again. We, we're all used to that, but as a learner, that's a very, Oh, it's, it's going to really kill the enthusiasm. One of my favorite, yep. um, one of my favorite anecdotes about Ghostwriter Chat are the amount of people that contact me who are doing 100 days of code and saying, it's great because I've got you to talk me through the problem. When I get stuck, I bring up Ghostwriter Chat and it helps me debug the silly mistakes I'm making. So I'm not just there banging my head against the wall. So I, I really think with this, we've got something special because um, yeah, it's helping all those learners. It's helping all those developers. It's helping all those pros. I think it's, it's, cross-sectional in, in its appeal. And certainly I have a special place for it in my heart. <laughs> so uh, which part of the build was more complex than you expected? And I suppose conversely, which was easier to build than you thought it would be? That's a good question. Um, I think building a nice interface was much harder than I was expecting. Um, okay. I would say working like working with the the language models are was surprisingly easy um you know if you host one or you use a public api like it's like text in text out so like that part was pretty nice um and like pretty straightforward so that was pretty hard honestly was getting like good prompts good prompts and like a good user interface and kind of thinking how do people want to use it so you know we something with ghostwriter chat we didn't want was people having to paste code blocks for example like you're in your environment you have all we have access to all of your files you shouldn't have to you know copy a giant code block and you know paste it into the chat message asking a question we we should be able to do that for you and that's one of the things i think benefits we have that a lot of other products might not is that it's like tightly coupled with your editor mm -hmm. so doing all of that in an efficient way was pretty hard and like kind of like working through the user flows and getting a nice responsive ui um thinking about all the things and gathering those heuristics i've got to say though it's it's such a difference having 
the AI assistant just there in your editor. It makes such a big difference. Um, I, I've said, said this story many times, but I was doing some Flask work recently. Um, and it just suddenly occurred to me halfway through coding something that I've never looked at how caching works in Flask before. <laughs> and in any other day, I would have gone, oh, and forgotten about it and never looked it up again. But because Ghostwriter Chat was just there, I just went, you know, oh, how does this work? And it properly explained it to me, gave me examples of code. And in that same project, I had caching set up in a few minutes. And I never would have touched it if not for that interface being right there. So I think that's a, a big win. Um, so the last question I've got for you is what's next for Ghostwriter Chat? Yeah, we Ghostwriter Chat is in a good spot right now, but we want to give it more power. We want to be in the world one day where <laughs> Ghostwriter Chat will drive more workflows. like. Instead of us saying, hey, Ghostwriter Chat, here are the files. How awesome would it be if you ask it a question and it figures out which files are relevant for you? Mm -hmm. And we hope to be in the spot where you ask it a question and then it can kind of, you know, handle forks and logic on its own. Is this a question about Replit? Do I need to go look at Replit docs? Is this a question about my files? Do I even need file context? Is this a question, just a general programming question? Like, for example, how, to, how does caching work in Flask? That, you know, we don't really need to look at Replit docs. We don't really need to, you know, look at your file context. So we, we hope to make Ghostwriter even more integrated in your editor, be able to take some actions on your behalf, hopefully at some point, and just get smarter about what it chooses and chooses not to construct its prompts. Fantastic. Well, I look forward to that. I'm uh, rubbing my hands together with glee and counting down the, the hours until we get there. But Mohamed, thank you very much for speaking to us in Behind the Code and giving us a peek behind the curtain onto how something so amazing has been built. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.